All right, everyone, welcome back again. We're here with Jeff Jenkins, the Nashville Bass Guru. I just gave you a new title, the, the Guru of Bass, but really... You know what, you're saying that, I'll, I'll interrupt you because yeah. I, I think the proper word is historian. Historian, and So okay. everybody calls Marty Stewart the country music historian. He, okay. he has all this uh, archive of photography and, and things that he, he's done throughout the years, and, and, and he has this head knowledge mm -hmm. of things that go all the way back to the earliest days, the Carters and yeah. Leuven brothers. And, you know, he, he's just an immense, full of knowledge. And I, I think if I'm anything, I'm a yeah. historian. Well, I want to talk, because you do wear a lot of hats. So you were, I mean, I want, okay, let's do the segue, but wrap up, wrap up the Pigeon Forge in Knoxville. So you're playing in this band, really popular. Well, how does that lead you to Nashville? And then... All that. So again, uh, the singer that we were using at the time um, was a singer at Country Tonight. Yeah. And he wa he had already been there a few years, and he wasn't happy. And we were doing this thing, and it was taking off, and it was doing well. And and like I said, we had people that had been in the business and had success that thought, "Yeah, man, you guys need to go do a demo. You need to record. You need to see if you can do something with this." Also, um, we had a guy. Uh, he was dating this girl that was the uh, choreographer for the Country Tonight show, and he was uh, Toby Keith's fiddle player. Uh. And I'll, I'll, he had been in a movie with Willie Nelson. Uh, I forget which movie it was in. But anyway, uh, he was in. Like, he was in royalty. He mm -hmm. was in. He, mm -hmm. Not only in Toby's band, but like he, he was in. So he would come up, he was dating this girl, and, and he would come up, and he started being a part of the scene, and he would come out. And uh, then we had another guy, his name's Terry McMillan, and he was a famous uh, harmonica yeah. and uh, conga player for all the Nashville sessions throughout the years. And he was dating a girl uh, that owned a, a hotel uh -huh. in Pigeon Forge. So he becomes part of this counterculture thing. It's like, you yeah. know, I'm hanging with Terry McMillan and not even know... <laughs> I don't even know what a legend right. I'm hanging with. One night we had him and another guy that played harmonica at the Country Tonight show, and they're both equally talented. And literally, like, they both got harmonicas in each hand, and it was like an octopus up there. I mean, it's like <laughs> it was the craziest thing you've ever... If you don't know Terry McMillan, just listen yeah. to, like, Garth Brooks records for anything that's got a harmonica on it, and it's just like, ain't going down, the sun comes up. Right. That's Terry McMillan. And it, it's the most amazing thing you've ever heard, and if that's not enough, you should hear him play percussion. I mean, he's really? passed on, he's not with us anymore, but... Um, Tremendous studio session musician from Nashville, but he's he's up there and and I've got this Toby Keith's fiddle players up there and all these guys and they're like You guys are it like you're every bit as good as Rascal Flatts. Mm -hmm. You gotta go. You gotta go You gotta go and we're like should we we've all got really good gigs here like yeah. I don't know Yeah, I had topped out. I, I really feel like I had topped out I felt like I was making the most money of any bass player in Pigeon Forge the Toby Keys fiddle player says, well, I'll get you in Tootsies. I'll get you guys a regular shift. You can play Tootsies. Wow, I can play Tootsies? Yeah. I mean, I'm like, I'm so naive. I don't, that sounds like <laughs> I'm going to be on the Grand Ole Opry next <laughs> right, week. Right, right. I can play Tootsies. Okay, anyway, so anyway. No, I got So sure enough, uh, we, we made a decision that, that as a band, we had uh, Louise Mandrell's drummer and Country Tonight's lead singer, and Country Tonight's guitar player and myself on bass, uh, and, and we were going to move as a band. Oh, and uh, there was a girl, uh, the lead singer's girlfriend um, was going to sing as well. Uh -huh. She was going to be part of the group. It wasn't the original plan. <laughs> it was sort of the... Uh, yeah. The Beatles. Yeah. The Yoko <laughs> Yeah, it was a little bit. But she's good. Yeah. She is a good singer. No, no. And, and, and no, no diss to her whatsoever. It was just uh, that wasn't the original plan. Yeah. But anyway, it became the plan. So once we got to Nashville and we started playing Tootsies, that was the band. And, and we moved. And uh, six weeks into being here, we had a major fight yeah. out in the parking lot one night of a club we were playing. And basically, the other two guys had, had uh, decided to go against me. The, I say two. We were really a three-piece kind of a group, business-wise. And so the other two, I guess they had just decided that they didn't want me in it anymore. We just weren't going to come to terms. And so the guitar player that we had moved, he had already left. He had already decided he went into it. He wanted to do his own thing. And so... Um, I had been approached 
somehow by a great songwriter here in town that had hits. Matter of fact, uh, he at the time that we met, he was having his biggest hit. Uh, it was a song called uh, Broken Hartsville. His name is Randy Boudreau. Mm -hmm. And he had come upon me somehow and heard that I had abilities to do uh, laptop recordings. <laughs> irony. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. much irony. And so I did. I did. I had a fresh MacBook and I knew how to operate Pro Tools at yeah. that time. And, and uh, just, you know, I think I had an M1 or something, just so basic. But, but it was enough for what he needed. And I guess here's one of the biggest, I look back on that and I think he was one of the biggest songwriters at that time. Why me? How did that happen? Again, yeah. Yeah. God's plan. So uh, here I am in, in my kitchen of my little tiny apartment that was over by the airport. And I'm doing demos. For, I'm not actually playing on them, but he's just coming and doing his songwriter demos. And, uh, you know, then from that experience, uh, he's like, let, let's get y'all out and let's get you some gigs, you know. And so he had a show where we opened up for somebody and he sang just kind of like just showcasing his songs that he had wrote and we backed him up. And then we were able to just sing some covers to support that or whatever. Sure. This was the remnants of the band that was at Tits. Yeah, you guys the guitar player and myself. Okay, okay, okay. Remnants. From that experience, then, I met a, a young singer-songwriter named Matt Stilwell, who was from uh, western North Carolina and right across the hill from where I'm from. And I, I had some friends that already knew him anyway. They would worked with him some, and they said, you guys need to meet up. And he, at that time, he was just a single act going out and doing acoustic shows for college kids, you know, and, and having a lot of success with that. But he decided he wanted to have a band. Uh, he wanted to put a single out. He wanted to do all the things and take his show up a notch with a real band. And so we started touring with him. And it was me and him and another drummer from Pigeon Forge, not the one I moved yeah. with, but, but another one from another theater who we knew. And we all moved at the same time. So uh, great experience. Uh, and we went out and we did that for about six months. And then he came back and he's like, guys, I don't know. I just, I think I want to go back to doing this by myself. Yeah. I'm not comfortable with the band thing. I think my thing is it's just me and the guitar. And it's no offense, nothing against you. You're great, but it's just what I need to do These for myself. These last two things you told me comes back to your first piece of advice. It's really hard to keep a band it's together. It's hard to keep a band together. So yeah. when that fizzled out, I was really distraught. And yeah. the guy that had taken my place at the theater that I left was not working out. And the word had gotten back to me that if I would consider coming back, they would consider having me. Mm -hmm. And at this point in time, I'm like, okay, well, I moved down here to be a part of that band and that's no longer. And then I transitioned from that to become part of this band and that's no longer. And I gotta make a living. And I just left the best money I've ever made in my life to come down here and do this. I, I think I've messed up. Yeah, yeah. So I told my second wife at that time, I said, we need to go back. And so I went back and not only had the guy that had my job was not gonna work out, but the band leader, the music director who had been there the whole time, he wasn't there anymore either. Uh, he was out. And so all of a sudden there was an opportunity for a music director. Uh, so I'm going back now, hey, guess what? I'm from Nashville. Yeah, yeah <laughs> For the yeah. first time ever. Right. You got yourself a Nashville boy here. Yeah. And I said, uh, I want that MD job. And they're like, okay. And they gave it to me. And, and so, I went in and I said, because we had done the show the same way from the time that I started with them until I left. We Same clothes, same everything. I said, nope, clean slate, new show, new clothes. We're going to have a fresh look. The, the look when I was in it before was we did a bluegrass section of the show and we were in overalls and T-shirts. I went back in and I put us in the highest quality country music performance clothes that their money would buy. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they went for it, the whole deal. And we didn't have a bluegrass section. Instead, we had a performance section where we were doing more like the Keith Urbans. Sure. We were doing the Brooks and Dunns and the things that, that were more relevant. Mm -hmm. And well, whether or not that was a good decision, looking back on that, I, I probably missed the forest for the trees. <laughs> so I don't think, even though I might have thought it was better, I don't think it was really any better. There, there was the an element. And, there was an element. There was a Appalachian Smoky Mountains right. element to what we did that was better suiting. 
So what I did was I took that element away and tried to make it yeah, Nashville, and, modern, yeah. and it wasn't Nashville. But anyway, learning experience. Sure. So uh, I, I, I felt like I did do a good job as an MD, but I was probably there about six weeks, and then it just hit. I'm just like, oh, I'm, I'm back. Yeah. And this isn't what it was when I left, because you can't, you can't go home. Yeah. In any way, it, 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 my second wife and I we moved back, but but I had already rented the house that I owned out to a guitar player from the theater. So we weren't going to go back to the house that I own unless I kick him out. Right. And I didn't really want to do that anyway because that house was from my first marriage. So I already was. I didn't want nothing to do with it. So I decided we'd get an apartment. And we'd actually live in town because where I'm from is 30 minutes away. So I thought, well, we'll live in sure, town. We'll sure. be suburban. We'll be, <laughs> you know, hip. And uh, anyway, the whole thing just was wrong from the get-go. But, but when I went back, um, I was there long enough to spend some time with my grandmother before she passed. Yeah. And ironically, by the time I had made a decision, I was in a contract, by the way to be there the whole year as music mm -hmm. director. And uh, once I'm back and six weeks in, I'm like, no, no, I'm going back. And uh, I get a, I think <laughs> one of the very earliest, I guess it was AOL. I don't remember what thing, I don't remember, MySpace. And I get this uh, DM from a guy that he said he had played with me. I don't even remember him. And I'd played with him at Tootsie's. Oh. And he said, he said, uh, I've got a friend and he's like, he just got a record deal, and uh, Teddy Gentry from Alabama is going to be his producer. And he's got a record deal, and the whole thing's in the can, and he's got a single going out to radio, and he's like, and he'd only played with me one time. But he's like, you're the guy. He's like, I told him, he's like, you're the guy. You need to be the guy. And this all happens at the same time that I'm realizing that I'd made a mistake and I yeah. needed to go back. Yeah. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like... I'm actually getting an opportunity to play with an artist and, and do the thing like, this is the real deal. And yeah. I'm like, like, you don't even know me. Like, <laughs> I don't know you. And, and he's, he's texting me. He's like, yeah. He's like, and, and, and like, you're the guy. And so I'm like, okay, well, send me the stuff. And he sends me the stuff. And it's like, it's great. It's like, it, he's every bit as good as Keith Urban. It, yeah. and the songs that he's written are, are pro uh Teddy Gentry produced six of the sides, and Mark Bright uh, yeah. produced the other six. Now, mind you, this record that's coming out sounds like two different things because there's two yeah. a polar, polar opposite producers right there. But each of them, I'm huge, massive, you know, respect for both of them. And uh, and then you know, I think there was a Jeffrey Steele cut on there. I mean, like we're we're talking some killer songs, killer. And I'm just like, this is unbelievable. Like, this guy's like the best thing I've ever heard in my life. He's got all these songs, and I'm like, I'm hearing singles. I'm hearing the whole thing. I'm like, I'm just seeing it all. It's yeah. flashing before my eyes. I'm like, long before I ever even got back to town, I didn't even really have the gig. I never met the guy. <laughs> and I just, I was already seeing it all. Yeah. So, uh, long story short, I'm like, okay, I'm out. I'm in. I'll do it. And and so I didn't even know if I had the gig. Never met the guy. Never talked to him. Nothing. But I uh, pack up my stuff. I get out of my contract, and, and they don't make me pay. They wow. should have made me pay, but they didn't make me pay. I guess they just knew. They knew that I needed to go. And so uh, again, my second wife, she worked for the resorts, so she was just flip flopping back. Right. It didn't matter to her, or whatever. <laughs> So she's like, she goes back to work, and, and, and I come down here, and we go back to the same apartments that we were in before. And I'm literally, I'm unpacking boxes while that wife was at work, and uh, I get a phone call. Hello? Uh, is this Jeff Jenkins? Yeah. Is this Teddy Gentry? Uh, I'm like, <laughs> what? And, and I mean, like, I knew it was. You know that voice. Yeah, yeah. It's Teddy Gentry. Hey, uh, uh, I want you to come down here at the office, and I want you to uh, sing. For us, we're going to, you know, try out a little bit for this artist, you know. I'm like, right. I'm like, this is real life. You know, I just can't believe this. I'm like, what time? I'll be there now. <laughs> yes. You know, he's like, okay. And it says uh, they had an office down on Music Row, and uh, and the artist was there, and his name was Eric Drantz. And uh, 
come on down. So I, I go down there, and, and I'd already had the material. I'd been living with it for right. three or four weeks, maybe maybe a couple of months. So I knew it. New sing and harmony. I mean, that's all of it. I just, bam, you know, and they're like, well, why don't you sing together? Let's see what you sound like, you know. And I'm just sitting in a simple office on Music Row, and I'm in there. Eric starts playing his song, and, you know, we literally had just met right there, he and I. Like, wow. well, I don't even know that we'd yeah. even said, hey, I'm Jeff, you know, nothing, yeah. just like, just on the spot. And I just start singing with him, and it just sounds like magic, because it's just like it was meant to be. It was great. I thought it was great. Teddy thought it was great. If anybody knows Harmony, Teddy Gentry knows Harmony. And, and so he's like, he looks over there, and he goes, this is your boy. And, and Eric goes, wow. yes, sir. What Eric, a compliment. Eric goes, yes, sir. And uh, I go, okay. <laughs> He's like, well, I thought I got the gig. He's like, no, you're going to be the band leader. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I just, you don't yeah. know me. You just met. I just, this is blowing my mind that I literally hadn't even unpacked my boxes and made this move to go back. And here I am, like the dream is unfolding yeah. before my eyes. And it's like, okay, now next week, uh, y'all going to be on a plane. You're going to go on a radio tour. And I'm like, what's a radio? <laughs> and they're like, well, you're going to go to these radio stations, you're going to play acoustically, and you're going to play the single, and a couple of other songs that are going to be the next singles, and you're going to warm up Eric to the DJs and the and their uh, promoters yeah, and everything, yeah. and they're going to get to know who he is as an artist. And I'm like, you mean I'm going to get to fly around? And I'm like, what? I, you know, and they're like, what do I wear? And they're like, oh, we're going to give you clothes. I'm like, well, what, I, what do I eat? And they're like, oh, they're gonna, they'll pay for every meal. I'm like, <laughs> so what? Weird. Are you kidding well, me? The... Yeah, I mean, like, so all I got to do is show yeah. up to the airport and all this, you know, it's so, so it's like, this is blowing my mind. And so we did this for probably a couple of months. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, that experience is really difficult because um, those program directors and DJs, they don't care anything about you. You think you're going into a situation that is all about you, and they they really don't care. Mm -hmm. They really don't care. And unless you're giving them a gift, unless you're padding their pockets, yeah. I'm being I'm being yeah, legit. Right. I don't know where this is going, but I ain't got a thing to lose. I right. don't care anymore. If you're not padding their pockets, they don't care anything about you. Yeah. Pale and, is and, still and alive. It is. Right? And yeah. so and and I got a I got a real <laughs> accurate look on that from that experience. But we did it, and we still, we were great. We sounded great. There's video clips out there on YouTube if you want to look it up. You, Eric Durant's, uh, you know, whatever. But uh, long story short, uh, Eric had had the opportunity to write a song with Jake Owen um, prior to this event. Uh, and Eric had already had a record deal with a rock label out of New York, which still was his label. Okay. And they were willing to take this new venture on because they didn't know what to do with Eric. Eric had been signed originally to do rock, and he came out of the same sand as Creed. They're oh, all out of the panhandle of Florida. And basically, I think, honestly, I think they signed him to shelve him to not be a competitor. Interesting. Against Scott Stapp, because they sounded exactly alike wow. and looked similar, you know. So, long story short, uh, he, he was with this label. They had um, Creed, Seether, Evanescence. Uh, they had all these bands. Yeah. I don't even know yeah, who some yeah, of them yeah. are, but they had all these bands. And they were uh, just an old couple that were millionaires. And that's all they cared about was just making rock records and being cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, long story short, uh, Eric's on this label with them, and he's like, you know, you're not doing anything with me. I'm going to go down to Nashville. I'm going to make some country. I've got a country I bone. See. I'm going to go make I some see. country music. And they're like, we don't care what you do. You're not going to bother us. And so sure enough, he gets down here and he meets Mark Bright. And Mark's like, man, you're a killer. Yeah. Uh, and, and you sing through the stratosphere and you look good. And, you know, so Mark's like, I'll cut six sides on you. And so then uh, he sends that back to them. And they're like, that, what are we going to do with this? We're not in country music. And so then somewhere along the line, Eric meets Teddy Gentry. And Teddy says, well, I may cut six odds on you. Know, you know, blah. And so Teddy does. And then Teddy and another business partner get together. And they're like, what if we talk, you know, this record company this into letting us open a, a, a Nashville office? Oh. And, and you being the breakout Nashville country artist for this label. And they're like, okay. You know, and it's like. 
we're not putting any money into this. Yeah. And they're like, oh, we don't need you to put any money into it. You just just let us just do this sure. under your umbrella. Because he's still under contract. Yeah. So you got to. And so they did. And and that's how it got started. And uh, he was in with another guy named Bernard Porter. And Bernard had been successful in at uh, the earliest stages of Broken Bow and had signed Jason Aldean to Broken Bow. And he had some uh, abilities there. Well, so that comes to be a big thing. So, so what happens is um, we do this couple of months out on the radio tour with a, a radio promotions team that, that puts us out there. And, you know, the single doesn't even chart, I don't think. I don't even know if we broke one, 100 with the single. Great song, but I think they all knew it was basically just going to be a wash just to get some traction. Right. They, they thought the backup single would be where... He and like you said, maybe they, because they weren't getting the funding from the, maybe there wasn't any money. There was no pocket, money. You know? To my understanding, there yeah, was yeah. no money. I don't know. Yeah. I often wonder. Right. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> was making money. Yeah. It wasn't us. But anyway, long story short, um, we, we get two months into the deal and uh, we get called into the office in Franklin and they're like, uh, yeah, you guys are going to be the opening act on this year's CMT tour with Jason Aldean and Lady Annabellum. <laughs> and I'm like, two months into me moving back. And I mean, just, just can you begin to imagine, my mind is just daily blown yeah. with just this onslaught of like, man, when it rains, it pours. Yeah. You know, here we go. We, we, we've we been out doing radio tour, and now we're going to be the opening act for the CMT tour. I would literally just taken my daughter in Pigeon Forge to the CMT tour. CMT tour the year before, yeah. and I was like, I was exposing her to it. I'm like, I'm moving to Nashville, and this is what I want to do. And and she was like eight, so she yeah. she kind of got it. But I mean, I I was just speaking prophetically, you know, yes. if you understand that. I was speaking prophetically the existence of what would be to come. And that that year, the CMT tour was. Uh, Little Big Town, Sugar Land, and Jake Owen. And so there they were down there. Well, I was alluding to Jake Owen. Well, Jake Owen had been to school down there in the Panhandle, and Eric had gotten to know him in Tallahassee at the school down there, Florida State, where Jake was going to be a golfer. But then he had an accident, and he couldn't wow. be a golfer, so he started writing songs with yeah. Eric. And they wrote a song called Eight Second Ride, and Jake had a hit with it off of his first record maybe i'm not yeah. sure but anyway long story too. short um here we go we're going to go out and open this show and at least if they don't know our single we're going to be able to perform a song that the crowd is going to know from jake owen who had been on the cmt tour the year before and then not only that like Al Dean's guys, Rich, yeah. Tully, all the guys, yeah. you know we made fast friends uh they they loved us they they saw a lot of the hunger in us that, that they had themselves. Yes. And of course, Aldine had already set the precedent for what that new bro country sound was gonna be. He'd set the precedent. But, but we were more, Aldine wasn't a band. And even though we were Eric Durant's, we weren't necessarily a band, but we operated like a band. Mm -hmm. And our people saw each individual person in, in the group like they would a band. Sure. So um, you could kind of see things were changing a little bit, and, and um, whether they were for the good or for the bad, I don't know. But along that same line, then, all the money dropped out. All the people in New York like, we just don't. We're not into this. We don't do country music. This is below us. This is not, you know. Sure. So they, they bailed. And once the funding was gone, and any hope of any funding was gone, then the, the rest of it, of course, fell apart no matter how good we were. Yeah. I, I know for a fact that Al Dean liked us and, and all that crew, and, and I think, you know, there there could have been a pathway to Broken Bow. Sure. There could have been a pathway to us having something, but it, it just it just fizzled. Yeah. And Eric says, I'm going back to Tallahassee. I've had enough, and uh, you know, he somehow he got out of his contract in New York and just left. Mm. And, He's had success down there uh, with his own band, and the, he just does his own thing and marches to the beat of his own yeah, drum, and right. th that's where that left. And so that that's important because what happens there is the drummer in that band, um, Mitch, uh, he he had already had exposure uh, at Tootsie's, playing regularly, 
-hmm. and and to a certain degree i think he was still doing tootsie's gigs while we were out on the road sure and i hadn't done that since i had done it with the band that i had moved yeah so i i didn't i didn't know but he's like well let's just go back and do this and i'll get you in i'll get you in with the group i'm playing with he's like and we we got the good shifts yeah um what's the good shifts he's like we got the late night. We're the closer. We're the main thing yeah. every night. And he's like, this guy I'm playing with, we're playing five nights a week. And he's like, we make money. And I'm like, money? You make money? <laughs> What's money? Yeah. I hadn't made any money yeah. yet. Uh, this, on the timeline now, this is uh, eight months having moved back. That took a whole eight months for that wow, whole thing. Wow, that's, that's crazy. To, it's like a lifetime. To do <laughs> all that it did and then fizzle out. Yeah. It took about eight months. Up and down. Yeah. So here I am, and I'm like, I'm back at Tootsie's. And all of a sudden, I'm playing five nights a week on the good shift with a good, you know, crew. And we were basically like the motley crew of Broadway. <laughs> uh, and, and mind you, this would have been 2009, so you didn't have all these flux of all these new bars. Yeah. At that time, you had Tootsie's. Rippies, Legends, The Stage, Second Fiddle. There were a couple of crossroads and some things across the street, but it was mostly within that block. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Nothing really much beyond. You had Wild Horse and all the things that were on Second Avenue, but but you just didn't have what you have now. So there wasn't a whole lot. So I mean, like we were we were rocking. We were doing great, but um, I was depressed because I saw that whole thing that I dreamed of. I saw that whole evolution happen and mm -hmm. peak and fall to nothing within eight months. Yeah. And so I started drinking. Yeah. And uh, I, I realized pretty quick that with me, I wasn't a drinker, but that I was a, uh, I was a damage plan. Mm. I was a, how can I, you know, just pass out every night? Yeah. What can I do? Because I wasn't happy. My marriage, that second marriage wasn't working out. I, we, uh, we didn't even see each other. And so I just started just massively drinking on those shows. And, and the thing about the, that whole counterculture, if you're playing down, down there. Down on Broadway. Yeah, on Broadway. If you're playing down there and you, you, you have to, there's a rite of passage. You're going to, at some point, you're going to be exposed to this. And to a certain degree, I don't know, I, I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but I almost feel like you have to go through a certain amount of it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I, not only did I go through it, but I got all of the badges <laughs> and somehow lived to, to tell the tale. Um, but to the point that uh, after playing with that group, I think for two years straight, so this would have took me to 2010. In the end of 2010, uh, to the point that I got there and basically couldn't even finish the shifts because wow. I would just be obliterated, uh, you know, by one o'clock in the morning, you know, starting a shift at 10 and, and by one o'clock in the morning, just be obliterated, couldn't even finish the shift. And so they let me go. And I was like, wow, you know, you're a hypocrite. You're sitting here, mm -hmm. you're doing it. You're drinking, yeah, but 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 I'm gonna be the fall guy. Okay, all right. So anyway, um, had endured uh, the second divorce at that time, which was an easy divorce for both of yeah. us. Amicably, we we just we we were MIA and had been for years. No problem. Um, but all of a sudden, I'm alone again. Yeah. I hadn't been alone. Yeah. I hadn't been alone in a long time. Yeah. I'm alone. So the drinking got worse, um, but but eventually um, I met my wife, who I'm married to now, and she had just moved from Texas, and she didn't really, you know, come to Nashville to get a job as a bartender. She wanted to sing, but she actually had an amazing career from where she had come from in in Houston. She uh, was project manager and worked at Texas Children's Hospital. So she had a great career. She was just taking a break from corporate America and, and just seeing, you know, could she sing? Could she do those things? So we met and just instantly fell in love. And that whole scene didn't work out for her. Uh, 
bartending and and along the same time was the the things falling apart for me as well and so she's like you know what you need to get out of here you need to dry up this isn't who you are so you know you need to get away from that scene and if you get away from it you'll find you don't need it you won't want that and and you well, good you, for her yeah for you believing in you yeah oh well, she's every part her and her and my dad are are the ones that i owe everything to no no question but anyway um, so, uh, I walk out of that and a guy calls me and he's like, Hey, um, uh, I know you from Tootsie's. I saw you a few times. You saw me a few times. He's like, uh, I'm, I'm doing a radio tour. <laughs> Here we go. Really? You're doing a radio tour. And so he's like, yeah, he's like, I, I'm self-promoting. I, I'm doing it on my own and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to do any massive things, but, but, but I'm serving a single and, and, uh, he's like, I, I just feel like you're the guy and he didn't know my experience with Eric Durant. Right, right, right. he just yeah and I'm like well turns out you know I've done radio tour I might can be able to help you in more ways than sure. one so anyway uh he was kind of my saving grace for giving me a, an immediate trampoline as soon as I was off the street I was on to something mm -hmm. professional and so I worked with him for probably about a year. And in that time, you know, we would do some shows and things. And I really don't, I really don't know how I made money. I don't know how I survived in that time period. I don't remember that very well. But, but I know I didn't work as much as I usually had because I just wasn't doing Broadway anymore. Right. So anyway, long story short, um, I get... A call from a friend of mine, guitar player, uh, he had been playing with Kelly Pickler. And we had done some shows together, some gigs. And, and so he says, um, hey, I'm working with this songwriter kid. He, he's fresh out of MTSU, but he's really good. And uh, uh, he's got hits already. He's got like three number ones that he's wrote for other people. And he wants to do his own thing now. And his name's Eric Pasley. Hmm. And he said, uh, I can get you in. I'm like, get me in? <laughs> okay. And so uh, I go and I meet Eric, and we hit it off really well because, I mean, he's, Eric's the nicest guy in country music. If that's something that can be said, yeah. then yeah. that's who Eric Pasley is. So we get it along really great. And, and so uh, a guitar player brings me into the band. I'm like, okay, well, this is cool. Well, so then the guitar player, I don't even know if we ever did a show with him. Good friend of mine, by the way, but mm -hmm. we never even did a show with him. So we ended up having to put together a whole band, and once again, I'm the band leader. <laughs> How does this keep happening to me? Uh, who decides this? Well, Eric's uh, manager at the time, I don't, I'm pretty sure he's not the same manager, but uh, manager at the time was Amy Grant's manager. And so there was a connection there, and, and uh, really, really good, level-headed people running the ship appropriately. Yeah. I'd never seen that before. <laughs> I'm like, this is fresh. So anyway, uh, not only is Eric the nicest guy, management team, everybody is so great, it's so nice. And I'm the band leader, and here we go. And, and, and so then I get a call, hello. Yeah, you guys are going to be on the Country Throwdown Tour with Eric. <laughs> it's a, a thing that, that gives that whole list over yeah, there on the yeah. wall. But it, it's uh, this was going to be country music's version of the Vans Warped Tour. Ah. Promoted by Vans Warped, by the way. Crazy. Gotcha. But we were going to be out slinging mud. Instead of being in arenas, <laughs> uh, we were going to be out in all the mud baths. Yeah, but, yeah. but still, uh, I, I think there were like nine acts, uh -huh. you know, from Gary Allen, Rodney Atkins, uh, uh, Eric and and the list goes on and on. So so we're on this major major mud tour, and here I am. I'm back out on tour again, and I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> and then uh, we're on a we're on a sub stage. So there's a main stage where the bigger acts are going to play, but we're on a sub stage. Still cool. We're on tour. Uh, everything's going great. The very first act is this group of guys, and they're playing like heavy metal <laughs> mm -hmm. and they look heavy metal they got mohawks they got tattoos yeah. they got all the things and they're pulling behind their van they're pulling because uh, the whole thing was put on by kingsford charcoal and so they're pulling this huge charcoal thing and every night after the thing could talk about counterculture right 
the biggest one I've ever seen in my life. We had a counterculture of, of all these acts and their bands and everything. Yeah. It's like hippie movement right, right. out here. And they're grilling hamburgers and hot dogs every night. And, you know, and, and this opening act is doing it. And they, they were called Florida Georgia Line. Ah. And nobody had ever heard of them. And it was just like, this is just insanity. <laughs> and so I, I met the drummer from Florida Georgia Line. And we had met before at a casino where we'd played on some other gigs or something. So we, we had a connection. It's like, and immediately we just, we hit it off. Well... So we go, we do that whole tour and everything's great, killer tour. And at the end of it, you know, by then at the end of it, Cruz had hit and they were already legendary. They're still the opening act. Right. But I remember we did the last show and I'm like, yeah. I'll, I'll be winding cables for you guys yes, now. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've been, you know, you've been opening our shows <laughs> and now I, now I need a job with you. You know, it's, it was so funny. But anyway, uh, tour ended and they had success and then they let that drummer go. And it was really unfortunate for him. It, it, it hurt, you know, hurt yeah. in a lot of ways. But he had a connection to another singer out of uh, North Carolina, and that singer was working with Brantley Gilbert. And those guys were writing a lot of hits and and hitting it off big time. So he gives me a call and he says, "Hey, um, working with this guy," and he's like. I really think you're the guy. <laughs> that seems to come up a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, I really think you're the guy. And uh, I don't think I wasn't the band leader. He was the band leader. I didn't have to band lead this time. But, but he's like, you're the guy. And he's like, you know, he's like, this is going to be cool. And he's like, oh, by the way, we're opening for Brantley Gilbert and all his arena tours for the whole year. Not just for a tour, but for the whole year. I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. And I'm still with Eric Pasley at the time, I'm, but but Eric, we had finished the tour, and we really weren't doing any dates. And Eric impressed upon me that that his main deal was songwriting, yeah. and the artist thing was a backseat. And if there was opportunity for that, he'd take it. But I I just knew I was never going to pay my bills sure. with Eric Pasley. And so I went to Eric, and I'm like, Hey, man, I love this. This really breaks my heart because we've kind of got a family thing going on here. But I'm like, I got a good opportunity. I need, I need to take it. And he's like, I totally understand. He's like, you, you need to do that. And, and I did. And so I left and I went to this, this guy's name was Brian Davis. Brian and Brantley had made big friends and were writing and had publishing deals together. Uh, and so next thing you know, I'm back in the arena. I'd left the mud tour and I'm yeah. back in the arena and I'm on an arena tour again with Brantley Gilbert and touring with those guys and uh, Kip Moore. And, you know, we just had a, a killer little four piece band, really a three piece band. Me and the former drummer of Georgia Line, Florida Georgia Line, and the guy, a uh, guitar player, he now plays acoustic guitar with Chris Young, uh, but, but he was our lead guitar player. And we just had a heavy, heavy sound. Just, just the opposite of anything I'd ever done in my life. This, if I ever could have incorporated Seattle into country music, yeah. we talked yeah. about that right, earlier. Right. Well, it happened there. Which makes sense because it happened Brantley, there. Because it you has right. There. The heavy I tour. did, but 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 we were heavier than Brantley. Really, we were. We we were way heavier than Brantley. Uh, there wasn't any rap involved, right. but 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 the music was like, the, and and Brian Davis, you know, I got his music and I listened to it, and I, I guess I thought that I was replicating it the way that it was on the record, but I wasn't. Yeah. And and it is by by accident, I ended up creating this tone that was somewhere between uh, Lemmy and uh, Getty Lee. Yeah where I incorporated a, a guitar amp and a bass amp. I don't really know where it came from, but from whatever, I, I'm trying to even remember, I'm pretty sure that Jimmy Lee Slos had done the, the session for the tracks. And he had a, a, a dirty sound, I'll say. Yeah. But, but, but for whatever reason, when it got to me, uh, I just felt like I, I needed to go grungier with it. And so I incorporated, uh, it, it started out with this, actually this yeah. uh, basement and what i did was i uh, i went into here there's a distortion channel here an overdrive channel yeah. and uh, and then i would split from a clean signal and i took the clean signal to an avalon u5 uh -huh. so i had avalon u5 for clean and then i had this for a dirty signal and i dumped all the bass mm. out of here mm. and so i, I combined the two yeah and that was with a sadowski um 
PJ was yeah. precision jazz pickup, five string. Yeah. And the majority of Brian's songs were in C sharp. Huh. So everything had a, uh, like a, a flat seven feel to yeah, it. Where right. when I went to the open B, I was on the flat seven. Yeah, yeah. And there was a lot of one flat seven four yeah. type things. Sure. And so without dropping any lower, like it was just already low. It, it was low. And the way I was attacking the yeah. bass, I don't think I was playing with a pick. I feel like I was doing the full-blown Getty Lee thing. Yeah. But I was just really getting a sound. And uh, and we were coming from a three-piece kind of a vibe. So the, the drummer, Jason, he's kind of like a Jason Bonham. You yeah. know, he used big drums. And he's a, a bigger guy. So he had the muscular foot behind the kick and the, the power behind the snares. Big sound. Big yeah. drum sound, big bass sound, and then just this uh, uh, amazing guitar player over here that, that was just riffing. Because I was providing all this extra, I was the rhythm guitar player and the yeah. bass player. Yeah, to make that huge sound. I made, three I made yeah. a couple of sounds out of one, and, and he was just able to just be over there and just riff and nice. just, just kick. And then Brian had the grungy, yeah, yeah, yeah. so whatever, however that sound <laughs> translates <laughs> to good. you. Uh, and we just went out there, and, and Brantley, of course, loved Brian, and there was no animosity. You Typically, when you tour, uh, if you ever get an opportunity as an opening act, you, you do whatever they say. It, anything that they give you is a luxury. If you get the corner of the stage to the op to the headliner, that's a luxury. Right. And if you talk bad about it, you won't get that. Yeah. So, but, but Brantley gave us the full stage. Like he, carte, carte blanche, you guys can have everything we have. We got their sound guys. We wow. didn't have to hire our, our own sound crew. Uh, we had their monitor team. We had their techs. Yeah. The, right. He gave us everything. And so we, we were basically Brantley Gilbert. Yeah. Uh, then Kit Moore was the middle act. And, of course, he had his own sound guys, had his own crew, had his own thing. So that, they weren't really involved. And then it was Brantley. But, I mean, like, you know, he just gave us so much. Wow. And it's just like... I felt like I had the experience to be in Brantley's band, you know, really. Right. And so uh, I think we did that for two years. Um, wow. And then what happened was uh, Brian was still going out and doing Brantley tours, but he was going to go out and do it acoustic without us. And I guess there just wasn't any money. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was a struggle for him because he really wasn't trying to sell his act as much as he was just trying to be out there and write songs with Brantley. Ultimately, he, at the end of the day, he's a songwriter, yeah. like Eric Pasley. Yeah, right. So so that, that you know, it wasn't his responsibility to keep my bills paid. Sure. So once again, I'm a side <laughs> man, and I'm out of a job. So uh, I didn't mention this, but the whole time that I had been back, even going back as far as early 2006, when I had opportunity, I would go to jam sessions and things that I thought were cool. And I, I, there was one in particular that was on 8th Avenue at a place called Center Stage. And it was um, just a bad part of town, man, yeah. you know. But, but it was a cool jam. And uh, there, there were great players. Uh, and I ended up jamming a lot with this guy. And his name was Craig Wayne Boyd. Huh? Yeah. We jammed a lot. And matter of fact, throughout this whole timeline that I've been talking about, Anytime I was talking about, I wondered where I made money, I remember now. I was going out and doing things with Craig Wayne Boyd. Any yes. opportunity that I had freedom to do, I was going out and doing things with Craig Wayne Boyd. And Craig just kept popping back up, popping back up. And uh, Craig actually knew Brian Davis, and they had the same manager. Ooh. And so anyway, uh, Craig would offer me gigs, and, and he had a thing going for a short time at the Wild Horse Saloon. We were a house band. And I loved him. I thought, man, this guy's such a good singer. He's probably the best singer I'd yeah. ever worked with. Besides Eric Durant's. Best singer I'd ever worked with. Powerhouse. So we had done a year uh, at, as house band. At When I say house band, we weren't the only band. But we were one of the regular bands. Yeah. So we were like a house band there. Um, and he come up to me one day and he's like, Man, I'm going to need to take a little break. I'm like, ugh, okay. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I got an opportunity to go be on The Voice. And I'm going to go see what that does. And I remember I looked at him right square yeah. and I said, well, that's going to get us some gigs. 
I never, you know, because you watch those things and you think, well, you know, okay, he gets on there and he sings one or two and then they send him home and right. we're right back to work. But I'm like, but I'm encouraged. Sure. I'm like, oh, I'll get some gigs. It's great. Go ahead. You know, I can pick up some gigs. And I did. And sure enough, he goes out there and full-blown wins season seven as wow. the winner. And, and we were just so much a big part of that. We didn't see him. He was gone that whole time. Didn't see him at all. I kept in touch, texted and things, but but he stayed out there in California and he did that and won the whole thing. And um, right before he won, he was down to as a finalist. And he came back and we did a show at the Wild Horse with Randy Hauser. Randy came on with us and it was a huge sellout show. By that time, everybody knew who he was because he was on TV. You know, yeah. it's just like, it's funny what that little bit of TV exposure yeah. will do for you. But he was a, a, a soap opera star at that time, you know. So anyway, we do this sellout show at the Wild Horse. And once again, I'm the band leader. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we, we put together an amazing band. Killer, killer band. And then he wins. And it's like, he, he calls me up and he's like, well, you know, obviously I'm congratulating him, you know, for winning. He's like, no, you don't understand. He's like, we're about to be gone. Lot. And he said, but you're it. You're the band leader. You're the guy. <laughs> and we're going to do in, he won in December of 2014. And he, they send me the 2015 uh, itinerary. And we're going to do 213 Ooh. shows. We're wow. going to do 213 shows. That's not travel. Yeah. Those are the shows we're doing. <laughs> and now, mind you, I'm on th marriage number three. And I had a child at that time that was two and a half years old. Yeah. And uh, so I'm on marriage number three. I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh, I, yeah. don't, I don't know, and, you know. Scary. But 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 yet, I looked at my wife, and she's like, oh, you you got to do this. This is it. This is yeah. everything. Got to do this. So she was a big encouragement. And at that time, she had been traveling. Uh, she had taken on a new job that required a lot of traveling, but she had just finally settled down and gotten one where she was regular in Franklin and we were living in Franklin and so um, anyway we we I do it and and uh, once again like a blip you know here's a year go by that you 213 shows and in that uh, we've got Opry performances yeah. um, several uh, you know that and, and and we had an opportunity to actually play on the voice and I got to play wow live on live yeah, network national, tv worldwide late yeah. at night everybody's watching it and i'm there and i get camera time like it wasn't just <laughs> i was there i get camera time i'm on the front I'm, I'm i'm like there i am and so it's like um wow what you know and um th then after a year happens and another episode of the voice happens and they forget who he is it's like that yeah. like that they yeah. forgot who he was, and they're on to the next guy. And it's just like you've just got that little window of time to, to do something with that. Uh, and, and, and it was over. And, and to no fault of him, because yeah. he's ever bit worthy, uh, but, but it just didn't work. And, and you know, I, we had done showcases. I, I forget, but we had done all kinds of showcases back when Nashville did showcases. Uh, at all the various different showcase venues here in town. We'd done them. We, and so many times we'd done showcases. And he won The Voice and got a record deal, yeah. mind you. Right. Um, I forget. It was, was it Lyric Street? I, I forget. who. It, it, yeah. Uh, no, I guess it was the ones that had Taylor Swift. Oh, Big Machine? Big Machine. Yeah, yeah it was Big Machine. Got it. So, so he wins... And he goes back like two weeks later after he wins, and he goes into the office, and they're like, "Who are you?" No, oh, man. It's like I'm Greg Wayne Boyd. <laughs> I just won the voice, and I'm just saying this. I, I I don't have any rights to say what I'm saying, so I I want to be loosely just so that everyone knows. Like that's just kind of how the business works. Yeah. It, don't don't be fooled by the glitz and glamour, because. You know, it's a hard road. Yeah. Success is a hard road. And even when you think you got there, there's so much more work and to I be done. And I think that's great advice. And so anyway, long story short, uh, that didn't pan out. And so once again, I found myself 
<laughs> back on Broadway. Yeah. And Broadway see, keeps coming back up. And it's, it's, it's this thing, it can be this thing to where uh, if you've conquered your demons, if you have understood your place, if you know what Broadway is and what it can be and what it shouldn't be, then you're able to go in there and make it work for you. And that brings us to the now. Yeah. Now, along that way, we also endured the two and a half year COVID lockdown. But you were also filming with bands. I, I want to get to now, but you're, you tell me that you played with Little Texas just for a little yeah. stint and a couple, you know, a few other acts. Yeah. So you were filling in here and there just with a bunch. Of yeah, I made I made a lot of friends. Uh, yeah. I made friends with the guys from Little Texas, and and of course that. We didn't talk about this earlier. Yeah. You and I have talked about it yeah. before, but they're the very reason I think that I play country music at all. Yeah. Uh, I, I wanted, not only did I want to be those session guys, but I also I wanted to be Dwayne Propes. I yeah. wanted to be the Steinberger bass playing yeah. country music. <laughs> you know, I, 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 want, I didn't want to take his gig. I, I wanted my own gig, but I wanted that. Yeah. I wanted what he had. Uh, and so I owe a lot to those guys, but, but yeah, I had, I had played with, uh, them. I'd played with, uh, oh, let's see. Uh, gosh, they're, they're all fading, but I've, I've done, <laughs> yeah, I've done a lot, lot of yeah. fill-ins uh, sure. recently at Brantley Gilbert. Yeah. Um, just only a couple of years ago, I think I played with Brantley for three and, and it was headlining in arenas, Crazy. the, the headlining experience that yeah. I, that I never got to have. I had been the opener, I'd been the middle act, but I'd never been the headliner. Wow. And so, you know, just, it don't matter if you're subbing or not, you know, that, that's an experience and, and, you know, just luxury Sure. Yeah. in, in every sense of the way. Um, you know, Josh Grayson was one yeah. of the other yeah. ones that I had played with, um, uh, low cash before the, they were low cash cowboys when I played with them. That you know, there, there was quite a few that that I had opportunities to play with, and and uh, they were great experiences. And and you you I look back now and I think, well, you know, there was a reason why none of those were ever meant to be long term. But uh, the long story here is is that I I am a side man. I didn't start out being a side man. I started out wanting to be a band. In the 90s, that's what it was. You yeah. had bands. Yeah. Rarely did you have a single act. Sure. Single acts were just like, you just didn't see that. That came more towards the late 90s and the early 2000s when Blake Shelton, you know. And I think it's when everything went corporate and they said, we don't have to pay a band. We can just go and say <laughs> if guys. they ever even did pay a band. Right. But in, in, in the early 90s when I was breaking in, you know, it was Little Texas. It was Shenandoah. It was Sawyer Brown. Yeah. It was Restless Heart. Uh, Alabama. You know, it, it was bands. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a band. I wanted to be an equal part. I wanted to be uh, part of the thing and, part, and make the decisions. But uh, along the way... Um, when I guess I felt like that that wasn't working out for me, I had to make something work and I became a side man. And a side man is a completely different entity because when, when you're a side man, those people and their organizations don't owe you anything. Mm, yeah. And Tennessee is a right to work state. So then nobody have to, you know, give you notice. Yep. yep. They'd call you five minutes and say, Hey, you, you got nothing yeah. here. We're done. And, and, and no hard feelings. Sure. sure. What, what does that even mean? <laughs> no <laughs> hard feelings? Business, right? You just put yeah. me on the street. <laughs> I got to pay my bills. Yeah. No hard feelings. But, but in all honesty and to their own detriment, it really is no hard feelings because it, it's, it's just business. It takes a while to understand. But, the, and the, but it's interesting, too, that you mention Broadway because Broadway almost becomes the constant in a way that it's, I'm not going to say safety net, but it's a place if you've done it before and you, you it's like it could still work. I told somebody this last week. Broadway is the only place that I've ever been able to count on. But, but it's not because I can count on Broadway. It's because I can count on me. Right. And I know now having done it for so long, I know what I need to do just like a good fisherman knows what bait to put on. Yeah. I know what I need to do when I need to eat. Yeah. I know yeah. when I need to pay a bill and, and, and 
That's different because, like, even my wife, like, she doesn't really fully understand that. I don't think a lot of people are. We're going to talk about it. Yeah, somebody's worked in corporate America or they've worked in a job market or things like that. Like, they don't understand what is it to go be a hunter-gatherer. What is it to be a daily breadwinner? You you wake up in the morning and you have a financial need and you make a phone call and you're working in the next two hours. Crazy. Now... Could it be that that you know you make a hundred dollars? I've uh, yeah. Yesterday I made less than a hundred dollars yeah. on a shift, but I had a lot of fun. Right. But uh, it's 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 the um, the it's the quantity. It, it it you have to put it all into perspective. Some gigs are going to be a hundred dollars. Some gigs are going to be eight hundred dollars. Yeah. Some gigs are going to be four, and some you know might, you might even do one that doesn't pay anything. Yeah. And. I had a real good friend of mine, and he 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 said this to me, and it and it clicked, and I finally get it. And he said it's it's time versus money. And for the longest time, you know, the people in this business in this industry will sell you on the idea of exposure. They'll sell you yeah. on you need to do this for you. You're you're not where you want to be. You need to. I, uh, here's the big one: say yes to everything until you can't. Well, yeah. <laughs> well. Sort of. Yeah. Because you do have to have enough respect for yourself to know when to say no. And and you learn that through experience. You, you're not going to know until you know. But you can see red flags. I had a guy, he hit me up two weeks ago, and a good friend of mine, one of the first guys I ever met when I moved to town. Known him all these years, and he's always been a constant in my life. He's an artist. He started out being an artist here in Nashville, and now he's moved to Texas. And and he called, and, and he said, uh, hey, I, I need a sub to fill in for bass for me for a show in St. Louis. And uh, would you be interested in doing it? Well, sure. And and he's like, well, I need you to drive. You have to drive there. Meet us. Okay. Yeah. Uh, St. Louis, four and a half hours. Yeah. That's, that's okay. Some miles All right. Your he's car like, but I'll sure. pay your gas. I'm like, okay. Right. Well, I'm like, you know, you're playing Texas now. You've had some hits on radio out there in Texas. You're probably doing pretty good. I'm like, this is going to be a, a good pay date for me. And I'm, but won't you send me a, an offer? Yeah. And uh, I, and I said, and, and I'd like to have a hotel room because I'd probably bring my wife. That's a little bit of a drive, and I think I'd bring her along. And so he texts back and he says, well, you can have a cleanup room. And for anybody that doesn't know, a cleanup room is a room that's given to you. It's one probably one of the trashiest rooms in whatever city you're in. Uh, and it's used by the band for everybody to go in and take their showers right. when there's not a shower facility on the site for the venue. And so typically the bands, they're not staying there, so they don't care. So they come in there and they trash the place. You got wet towels all over the floor. You got drinks and food, and, and the beds are torn up from people laying there yeah. while they're waiting on the shower. It's trashed. Yeah. And and it's not an experience that you want, you know, when yeah. you've driven four and a half hours to get to the gig, you want a clean place to walk into. And especially, you know, so anyway, long story short. And then he texts back and he says, and so the pay is $200. Woo. And so, you know, there's time and a place that $200 makes sense. And he's a friend. And it, had that been in Nashville, I would have done that yeah. gig. Yeah. I would have done that gig. Yeah. He's a good enough friend. I would have easily done that gig. But you're asking me to drive four and a half hours to and from using my car. And then that's the pay that's offered. And so I broke, I broke it down to him and I said, all right. I got 14 and a half hours of my time in this. By the time I do all the driving, I do your show that's 90 minutes, and I put four hours of my time in learning it. Yeah. Because I'm either going to have to chart it or memorize it. Probably going to chart it. Regardless, 14 and a half hours of my time is what's going to be put into here. And I said, for your $200, that turns out to be $13.79 an hour. I said, (laughs) now, now, that's not going to work. You know, and I left it at that. We're friends. I said, what you need to do is you need to hire somebody in St. Louis that's a professional musician. They don't have any expenses in driving, and a $200 gig to them is a a bankroll. Yeah. They'd be happy to do it, and they'll probably do a great job. So, so, you know, why would you... Know your value. Yeah. So, but that's the thing. It's like, if there's, uh, you know, anything that comes out of this interview that I'm saying that's going to be good for a young musician, let that be one of the big ones, is is really take your time and break it down into an hour. 
by our thing and 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 know that your worth is stacked up against a, a 15 year old that works at chick-fil-a and makes yep. 18 bucks an that's hour. what i was gonna say yeah chick-fil-a is 18 an hour yeah so that i mean that's the reality yeah. and you're like oh but i get to play my guitar it's right. like yeah you will always get to do what people w- right. will abuse you for yeah that if if that is something that's <laughs> attractive to you we need to talk there, there, there should be, you know, a, a, a guideline. There should be an amount that 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 is reasonable. And and whether these artists are truly taking these gigs at low dollars for their own exposure, or whether they're actually getting paid really well and they're just seeing, yeah. if you will, either way is wrong. Yeah, yeah. They're both wrong. Yeah. The the models don't work. That you know these 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 venues need to pay more. Um, the promoters need to pay more, you know, or we need to rethink, you know, what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, that, that, that's, that's not, I want to get into Broadway. Well, I'm going to take a quick break. Yeah. Quick break. we we'll get a little bit more Broadway and then play some basses. Yeah. I'd love to. <laughs> we're going to play. All right, y'all. We're going to take a quick break. Be right back. 